In the fall of 2002, detectives with Florida's Brevard County Sheriff's Office were under serious pressure. For more than two years, they had been haunted by the brutal killing of a local young woman, one whose murder they initially believed they had solved, only for the case to slip through their fingers in the most frustrating way imaginable. Since then, police had faced mounting questions from both the victim's family and the broader public, who understandably wanted to know what had become of the investigation. Unfortunately, the truth was, there wasn't much to report. They had a suspect, but behind the scenes their hands were tied. Worst of all, this suspect seemed to know it. Just when it appeared like all hope might be lost, though, detectives stumbled across something that would change everything. In a twist of pure poetic justice, their suspect was about to be caught by a surprise witness that he never saw coming. On the afternoon of July 23, 2000, a Florida Circuit Court judge named Jerry Lober walked out into his backyard in the scenic community of Merritt Island, Florida. His sprawling waterfront property was located right on the Indian River, a well-known saltwater lagoon that runs roughly 120 miles down the east coast of the state from Volusia County in the north all the way to St. Lucie Inlet in the south. On this particular day, Jerry was planning to do some yard work. However, he didn't get very far before something caught his attention. Specifically, there appeared to be some kind of large animal carcass that was floating in the water by a collection of mangrove trees. This seemed to be confirmed when seconds later Jerry noticed a foul odor, one that was no doubt being helped along by the weather. It was a muggy day, the kind where smells just seemed to hang in the hot, damp air. Initially believing that this was a manatee, Jerry headed down to his dock area to assess the situation. However, what he found waiting for him there instead was something he would never be able to erase from his memory. What had actually washed ashore that fateful afternoon was the body of a young woman. It was clear that she had been the victim of a horrifying crime. The woman was completely unclothed and was lying face down in the water. Disturbingly, her hands and feet had been bound with rope and tape, and there was also tape in various places around her head, eyes, nose, mouth, and neck. At the woman's feet were some ripped plastic grocery bags, which had been tied on with pieces of rubber tubing. When investigators from the Brevard County Sheriff's Office arrived at the chilling crime scene, their first priority was getting the female victim out of the river where she had been found. Water of any kind always has the potential to wash away crucial evidence, and this situation in particular was a worst case scenario. Just from looking at the body, authorities could tell that the victim had likely been in the river for several days before being discovered with the hot, humid weather only increasing the rate of decomposition. It was almost a guarantee that some trace evidence had been destroyed, and detectives knew they couldn't afford to lose any more. After removing the victim from the water, her remains were sent off to the medical examiner's office. In the meantime, detectives took a closer look at some of the other evidence that had been found with the body. First, there was the rope, which had been used in various places to bind the female victim. Immediately, authorities noticed it had a red and white double diamond stitch pattern, one that they felt was fairly distinctive. The grocery bags that were found attached to the woman's feet were ripped, though police suspected at one point they had been filled with rocks or something else heavy by the perpetrator in an attempt to weigh the body down. It was determined that the bags had come from a Publix grocery store, and the rubber tubing that had been used to secure them to the victim's feet were actually pieces of screen spline designed to hold window screens inside their frames. Finally, there was tape, which as previously mentioned, was found in abundant quantities around the victim's face, head, and limbs. While the tape appeared to be similar to duct tape, it stood out to detectives because of its color. It was white rather than the usual gray or metallic. Authorities were especially interested in the tape because they knew its adhesive was one of the few things that might have been able to preserve trace evidence like fingerprints or DNA even in the water-filled environment where the body had been found. Unfortunately, no such evidence was recovered, though there were a few short black hairs that had managed to cling to the tape. 
detectives knew these couldn't belong to the victim because her hair was brown with a reddish tint in places where it had been dyed. These were sent off for testing, along with the rest of these other items. Though, unfortunately, as investigators would soon learn, no DNA evidence was obtained from any of them. Detectives received similarly discouraging news when they visited the medical examiner's office the following day for the results of the victim's autopsy. Any DNA or fingerprint evidence that might have been on the body at the time of the crime had long since been washed away. Due to the condition of the remains and the length of time that they had been exposed to the elements, the ME couldn't even say for sure what had actually caused the victim's death. However, the little that they were able to piece together told a chilling story. There were no signs of bullet wounds, knife wounds, or any other real trauma to her body. To detectives, this left two equally horrifying possibilities. Either she had been strangled or suffocated due to the tape covering her nose and mouth, or she had been thrown into the water while she was still alive and had drowned. Thankfully, the autopsy did provide authorities with at least one solid piece of information. Using fingerprints, they were able to uncover the identity of their victim. Her name was Misty April Morse. Just after midnight on Thursday, July 20th, 2000, Linda Morse was awoken by a knock at her bedroom door in the city of Indian Harbor Beach, Florida. She looked up to see her 22-year-old daughter, Misty, who was smiling and excitedly standing in the doorway. Misty said that she was getting ready to go out for the night, asking how she looked and doing a bit of a joking spin to show off her outfit. The pair laughed and made small talk for a bit until Misty's cell phone rang and she stepped out into the hallway to take the call. Seconds later, she popped her head back in, saying that she had to go. While there was nothing at all out of the ordinary about this exchange at the time, little did Linda know that soon it would be forever burned into her memory. You see, this was the last conversation that she would ever have with her daughter. Upon waking up a few hours later, Linda went to her bookkeeping job like any other Thursday. When she returned that evening, Misty wasn't home, Though this was pretty normal, as she primarily worked serving jobs at local restaurants, meaning that their schedules rarely lined up. When Linda returned home the following day, and it again didn't seem like Misty had been at the house, she was a little more concerned. She and Misty had standing weekly arrangements to switch cars, so she had at least expected to see her for a bit that afternoon. That being said, this wouldn't be the first time that Misty had simply forgotten about the vehicle swap, so Linda tried to put it out of her mind. When Misty still hadn't come home or reached out over the next couple of days, Linda had tried to call her several times. None of her calls were returned, and it was at this point that she seriously started to worry. Nonetheless, she questioned what the right thing was to do. You see, while it was strange for Misty to remain out of contact for this long, it wasn't that unusual for her to stay with friends for a few days at a time. Even though she lived with her, Linda also knew that her daughter was an adult, one who valued her independence and generally didn't like the feeling of being checked up on. Linda had lived in this agonizing sort of state of worried paralysis until July 24th, when she decided she needed to reach out to police. Before she could, however, she heard a knock at her front door. When she opened up and saw detectives from the Brevard County Sheriff's Office, she realized that her worst nightmare was coming true. Before they could tell her anything, Linda said, it's her, isn't it? Despite fearing the worst, understandably, Linda was still completely unprepared to learn the truth about what had happened to Misty. The horrifying details shook her to her core. When she shared the heartbreaking news with her ex-husband, Bob, Misty's father, he had the same reaction. Linda and Bob had always known Misty as extremely upbeat, outgoing, and friendly. She loved the outdoors, especially the beach, and enjoyed surfing, swimming, and simply being out in the sunshine. Like many people at her age, Misty spent a lot of time with her friends and liked going out and having a good time. She took classes at a local community college, but still hadn't decided what she wanted to do. At 22, it seemed like there was plenty of time for decisions like that. Tragically, she had now been robbed of her entire future. While neither of Misty's parents could understand how anyone could do this to their daughter, 
the situation was about to get even darker. Detectives were about to become convinced that the person who did this had to be someone that Misty knew. After vowing to help investigators in whatever way she could, Linda Morse allowed detectives with the Brevard County Sheriff's Office to conduct a thorough search of her home. That search was understandably focused on Misty's bedroom, and though authorities found everything more or less in its place, there was something that almost immediately caught their attention. Sitting on a chair in the bedroom was Misty's purse, which was found to contain everything except for her driver's license and cell phone. The discovery suggested two things to detectives. First, that when Misty left her mother's house on the morning of July 20th, she hadn't planned on being gone for very long. And second, she was almost certainly meeting up with someone she was very familiar with. Investigators were even more confident in this theory when they conducted a detailed interview with Linda about the last time she had spoken with Misty. It was during this conversation that she mentioned the brief phone call her daughter received while they were together right before she left the house. When detectives pulled Misty's cell phone records, they learned that there had actually been two calls made to her cell phone that night. The first call had come in shortly before midnight and had gone on for a few minutes. Then there had been a short gap of time before the second one. Since this call had only lasted a few seconds, police concluded it was the one Misty had received while she was speaking with her mother. Unfortunately, most phone records from 20 years ago didn't contain as much information as they do today. And in this case, investigators were left with particularly little. There was no data available about where the calls had been placed from, and authorities weren't even able to obtain the number of the person who had made them. Still, based on the timing and the duration of the calls, detectives theorized that they had both been made by the same person. That person had made plans with Misty and then had likely called again to say that they were there to pick her up. Since these two calls were also the last ones that had been picked up on Misty's phone, detectives believed that whoever was behind them was their suspect. As much as all of this seemed to fit together from a logical standpoint, Authorities knew that they would need more if they actually had a hope of catching Misty's killer. Luckily, it was at this point that they started piecing a few things together. It began when detectives were reviewing evidence photos and they once again started focusing in on the rope that had been found with Misty's body. After doing a bit of research, they realized that their initial instincts had been correct. This was a fairly specific type of rope, one that was normally used in sailing. Exploring this idea further, authorities started to notice a theme. That white tape that they previously thought was duct tape? It turned out to be sail tape, used for temporarily repairing sails and canvas aboard boats. Then there were the knots that the killer had tied in the rope and the screen spline. Police learned that one of them in particular was commonly taught to members of the U.S. Coast Guard and the Navy. Based on this, plus the fact that they knew Misty had been thrown into the water by her killer, detectives concluded that their suspect likely had a nautical background and may have served in the military. Finally, they had something to go on. The discovery couldn't have come at a better time either, as authorities were now preparing to take a closer look at the people in Misty's life. After finally uncovering a few details that they felt might be able to point them towards a suspect, detectives with the Brevard County Sheriff's Office went back to speak with Misty Morse's family. In particular, authorities wanted to know about any romantic relationship she might have had in the lead up to her death. Almost immediately, two names rose to the top of the list, Teddy Underwood and Bobby Cooper. Teddy Underwood was the brother of a friend that Misty worked with and someone who she had been seeing casually in the weeks before her murder. Authorities became interested in him after running a background check and discovering that he had quite the criminal history. In addition to multiple felony arrests, he had convictions for felony burglary and sexual battery. Bobby Cooper, on the other hand, stood out specifically because of the information that Misty's family had provided. They said that the pair had gone on one date and that Bobby was really interested in Misty, but that she didn't have the same feelings. 
Misty had told multiple people that despite this, Bobby appeared to be in denial and didn't really want to accept that things weren't going to work out between them. Teddy was the first of the two to be brought in for questioning, in part due to his criminal history. Though almost immediately, things didn't go the way authorities anticipated. Given Teddy's reputation as a bit of a tough guy, they expected it to be a difficult interview. However, he was extremely open with detectives from the start and seemed genuinely interested in helping. Teddy explained that he had been seeing Misty around the time of her death, but that it hadn't been anything super serious. He also agreed to provide a DNA sample, which detectives asked for more as a sign of his willingness to cooperate than anything, since they didn't actually have anything to compare it to. Did uh, she always pick you up, or did you ever drive over there? I used my mother car a few times. Who's calling in front of your house? The little blue city, that's my sister's car. And do you guys talk about a future together? Sort of. You know, not really nothing too crazy because I'm just, you know, about that. You know, trying to get married and nothing like that. We were a lot of life. You know, even down to the basic stuff. Just for the record, you provide us with two swallings, okay? Yeah. One on each side of your mouth, yes. each side of your mouth. Yes. And that was done of your own free will? Yes. Okay. You understand that's for DNA purposes? Yes. While detectives initially considered the possibility that Teddy's friendly and helpful demeanor was a deliberate tactic to throw them off, the longer they talked to him, the less likely this seemed. Any remaining suspicions they had about him were tossed out when Teddy agreed to let investigators search his apartment, where they didn't find anything connecting him to the crime. Teddy also didn't have any kind of military record, and he didn't appear to have access to a boat. Bobby Cooper, on the other hand, did have access to a boat. In fact, this was one of the first things that authorities noticed when they went onto his property to ask him some questions. During their interview, Bobby was fairly upfront about his romantic feelings towards Misty and the fact that she had made excuses not to see him again after their date. He characterized this as no big deal, though, and said that he had gone on trying to reach her for some time before hearing the horrifying news that Misty had been murdered. How long have you known uh, Misty? Almost two weeks. And uh, when was the last time you were at the house? Tuesday. I went and had a couple drinks, and then we ended up coming back out here and watching a movie. Okay. And you called her? Yes. Called her cell phone every day from then on out until I heard yesterday. Every day until when? Until yesterday. Got off work early and I got a phone call from our friend Randy. He told me what had happened. He told me that they had found her floating in the river. It was obvious to detectives that Bobby was emotional about what had happened, though they wondered if maybe he hadn't been quite as cool about being blown off by Misty as he had claimed. Their suspicions were raised even further when seemingly out of nowhere, Bobby made a startling admission. He had Misty's driver's license, one of the two items that police discovered missing from her bedroom. Bobby proceeded to pull out the driver's license and hand it over to investigators right during the middle of their conversation. He explained that it had been in his possession since the night of he and Misty's first date. She didn't have any pockets in her outfit, so she gave it to him for safekeeping and had simply forgotten to take it back. Understandably, detectives weren't sure if they believed this story. So once again, they asked to conduct a home search. Bobby agreed, but just like they had with Teddy, investigators came up empty. Yes, Bobby did have access to a boat, but none of the other items linked to the crime were found inside. He also didn't have any kind of military background. Just as police were getting ready to leave Bobby's house, though, he stopped them for a second and said that he had remembered something that might be of interest to them. He said that on their date, Misty had mentioned having an ex-boyfriend who she claimed had been violent with her in the past. Bobby said he couldn't remember the guy's name, but one detail definitely stuck out to him. He was pretty sure the guy had been a Navy SEAL. Deciding to follow up on the potentially promising lead they had received from Bobby Cooper, detectives went back to Misty's family to ask about her mysterious Navy SEAL ex-boyfriend. Immediately, Misty's mother, Linda, knew exactly who they were talking about. The man's name was Brent Huck. Brent and Misty had previously been in a long-term relationship, one that Linda said had definitely been rocky, especially because Brent could be pretty possessive. 
The pair had lived together for a short time, but it hadn't worked out. The reason Linda hadn't brought Brent's name up before was because he and Misty's relationship had ended more than a year prior, and as far as she knew, they hadn't been in contact since. When investigators started looking into Brent Huck, they quickly uncovered information that set off red flags. While it turned out that Brent had been lying about being a Navy SEAL, in fact, he hadn't even passed the swim test, he had been in the Navy. His current job also stuck out to detectives. He was a charter boat captain, one who happened to live on Merritt Island, close to where Misty's body had been found. It seemed like Brent was everything that authorities had been looking for. Someone with a military background who lived close to the crime scene and who had access to boats and a familiarity with nautical supplies. When investigators brought Brent in for an interview, they did their best to try and reassure him, attempting to lure him into a false sense of security with the goal of getting him talking. Right now we're kind of at a loss. We're grasping at straws, trying to get any information we can on Misty, and uh, we feel you're probably a pretty good source of knowledge what she does and who she hangs out with and this kind of stuff. You're not in any trouble, you're not under arrest, you're free to leave anytime you want. Oh, I'm not. You're here on your own free will, so. More than willing to help. That's my first question. Was both right now. We just, we just appreciate you coming down and filling in the blanks. Okay, mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's what we need is someone who knows her. Their plan turned out to be entirely unnecessary, though, as Brent appeared remarkably indifferent about the news of Misty's brutal death. This was despite the fact that, contrary to what Misty's family believed, the pair had continued to see each other casually after their relationship had ended. To detectives, Brent came off as arrogant and wasted no time disparaging Misty's character. What was your relationship with her? We started dating. Uh, from the time I met her, uh, she came to live with me in my house for a while, or stay with me in my house, not really live. The relationship deteriorated, and then it all actually deteriorated. We got, we, I broke up with her and she slept with my roommate. At that point, I, I was just, I was done with her. I did go to sleep with her after that. What about my other boyfriend? She dated some guy, some hockey, she said she was dating some hockey player. That's, and I would never got a name out of her. Um, from around here? She's up in Orlando, apparently, one of the pro teams. I don't, I don't know. It's just I talked to her enough to get mad sex, and I leave. So what do you think? My first reaction, she got in this office, she couldn't handle She got in that either somebody got hot with her and, and flipped, or she picked up the wrong job. I mean, I don't know if she's for sure if she's working on the red or if she's working on something. The only thing, and that's the only thing she could be doing, is helping. Amidst these rumors and outright lies, though, Brent did let something slip that investigators immediately picked up on. Unbeknownst to him, he admitted that he was the one who had made the final calls to Misty's cell phone right before her disappearance. When was the last time you actually talked to her? On the phone or anything like that? Wednesday. Wednesday morning, night, day? Uh, Wednesday, late night. Probably Thursday, probably the Thursday sometime, early morning. Okay. Brent went on to state that he had made these late-night phone calls after hearing that Misty had been telling mutual friends of theirs that she was pregnant with his child. He said that he called to confront Misty because he wanted her to stop telling people this as he was now in a serious relationship with someone else. Brent claimed that he never actually met up with Misty that night, though. He said their second conversation was just him calling back to say that everything was fine between them. Detectives, however, didn't buy this. While they knew that Misty had not in fact been pregnant at the time of her death due to her autopsy, it was clear that Brent didn't know this. They believed that when he heard the rumors, he had panicked and had called Misty asking to meet up with her. They theorized that this might also explain why Misty was so excited to go out when she spoke to her mother on the night she disappeared. She thought that she might be rekindling her relationship with Brent. Instead, she had been lured to her death. Just as they had with the previous suspects they had spoken to, following their interview with Brent, police asked to conduct a search of his property. Like the others, he agreed. However, unlike during the previous two searches, this time, authorities encountered a gold mine of evidence. Inside Brent's kitchen, authorities discovered Publix grocery bags. Manufacturing codes on these bags would later be compared to the ones found with Misty's body, revealing that they had been made in the exact same month and year by the exact same distributor. In the garage, detectives found screen spline, 
the same kind that had been found tied to Misty's feet. Again, tests would show that the tubing had been produced on the same machine. Then, there was the wad of sail tape that was found on the top of Brent's dresser. Analysis showed that the adhesive on the tape was a match to the tape that had been wrapped around Misty's body. Finally, there was the sail rope that was recovered from inside the house as well as by divers in the water near the dock on Brent's property. This rope not only appeared to match the rope that had been used to bind Misty, identical knots had been used in both cases. After receiving the lab results confirming the consistencies between the items taken from Brent's house and the evidence recovered from the crime scene, detectives were sure that they had their culprit. Once everything had been compiled, they took it all over to the district attorney's office. However, they didn't get anywhere near the reception they expected. Far from seeing this as a slam dunk case, the DA felt that this was way too risky to take to court, pointing out that all of the evidence was circumstantial. Detectives were told that if they wanted any hope of securing a conviction, they needed more. The problem, of course, was that there wasn't more. With that, the case began to go cold. It would remain that way for more than two years, until finally, new developments in technology allowed detectives to call upon a witness that no one saw coming. With their case deemed too weak to take to court, detectives had no choice but to go back to the drawing board. Frustratingly, this meant watching with their hands tied as their main suspect, Brent Huck, went on with his life as if nothing had happened. Eventually, news of this lull in the investigation made its way back to Misty's family, as well as the broader public at large, who were more or less left in the dark about what was going on. Still, it was clear to anyone paying attention that the situation wasn't good. Newspaper headlines had gone from stating that an arrest could come any time in the weeks after the murder almost a year later talking about hiccups and challenges in the investigation. In the meantime, Misty's family did what they could to keep the investigation in the public eye, in the hopes of procuring new leads. In a particularly heartbreaking appeal for information published as a letter to the editor in a local paper, Linda wrote in part, quote, Misty hated to be cold. Most of all, she hated to be cold and wet. She was left in the river. Behind the scenes, though, detectives hadn't given up. They were pursuing every avenue they could think of to try and uncover their smoking gun, even if it seemed far-fetched. As it turned out, it would be one of these apparent long shots that would finally pay off when in the fall of 2002, they received a call from a lab in Davis, California, called QuestGen Forensics. Now, in order to understand what this call was about, First, I have to admit that I wasn't telling you everything before when I said that there was no other evidence that detectives had. Okay, so do you remember those dark hairs that I mentioned a little while earlier that were found on the sail tape at the crime scene? It turned out that they were dog hairs, something which investigators had actually been able to figure out pretty quickly. That being said, there were two reasons that this evidence hadn't been super helpful to police at the time that it was initially found both of which had to do with the limits of DNA technology back in the year 2000. For starters, while animal DNA could be tested, there just wasn't a huge database of samples to compare it against. This is apparently important because without large data samples, it's hard to say what the distinguishing features are that might identify an individual when compared to a larger group. So sure, you could have DNA from this one golden retriever, but without having information about other dogs or even other golden retrievers, it's sort of hard to say, yes, this DNA had to come from this individual. Or at least that's how I understand it based on everything I've read. Okay, so that's the first part. The second challenge was the fact that none of the hairs police found had the root attached, which is where the bulk of usable DNA generally comes from for comparison purposes. Now, there is another technique which uses mitochondrial DNA, but it's a little more complicated, and suffice it to say that if regular dog DNA comparisons were a rarity in 2000, dog DNA comparisons using mitochondrial DNA weren't being done at all. However, as we all know, technology has a way of moving extremely quickly, 
So much so that by the time detectives on the Misty Morse case were re-examining evidence just two years later, these techniques were starting to be used in forensics. In particular, there had been a case out of California by this point where a man had been convicted of killing a seven-year-old girl based in large part on dog hairs found in his dryer's lint trap. When detectives heard about this case, they reached out to the lab that had assisted with this investigation. That lab was QuestGen Forensics. QuestGen was able to take the hairs found with Misty's body and show that they had come from Brent Huck's dog, a German Shepherd Rottweiler mix named Chiba. There was one final bit of poetic justice, though. Misty had bought Chiba for Brent as a gift when they were still together, and now it was Chiba who would be the key to solving her murder. On October 23, 2002, Brent Huck was arrested and charged with Misty's murder. At trial, prosecutors argued that Brent had killed Misty after believing that she was pregnant and fearing that this would mess up his new relationship. As a result, he chillingly lured her to her death under the guise of getting back together. To make their case, they used all of the previous circumstantial evidence the detectives had collected, as well as the DNA match from Chiba's hairs. In May of 2003, Brent Huck was convicted of first-degree felony murder as well as felony kidnapping and was given two consecutive life sentences. At the time of this recording, he remains incarcerated at Florida's Appalachie Correctional Institution. I don't know about you, but for me, this was definitely one of the most heartbreaking stories I've come across in a while. We'll probably never know exactly what happened to Misty Morse that fateful night, but just knowing that she might have been thrown into that water in the pitch black night, terrified and alone, alive, should be enough to make anyone's stomach turn. Then, there's the matter of Brent's motive. To me, it's beside the point that Misty wasn't actually pregnant. The fact that he thought she was, and that he did what he did, honestly defies comprehension, in my opinion. As for Misty's family, they reportedly said that while nothing could ever bring her back, they were happy Brent was off the streets and that they felt justice had been served. It was perhaps Misty's father who said it best, though, stating to a news outlet after his sentencing, quote, I hope he lives a thousand years in his cell to remember what he did and the pain and loss he has caused so many. Before we wrap up, we'd like to take a second to give a huge shout out to everyone who has made it this far into the video. Seriously, thank you so much for watching. If you found today's upload interesting and informative, we'd be honored if you consider liking and subscribing, as well as hitting the notification bell and selecting all notifications to stay up to date with our latest releases. If you're looking for additional ways to help support the channel, we'd love to have you join us over on Patreon. Patrons get ad-free and early access to all of our content, as well as four additional stories per week for each of our Crimes of the Week and Crimes of the Week International videos. You can learn more at patreon.com slash crimezone, where you'll also find some of the fine folks whose names are currently on screen. All that being said, we understand that not everyone has the means to support financially, and that's totally okay. We appreciate every like, sub, share, and comment that you send our way. Once again, Thanks so much, everyone, and take care.